Hello and welcome to this week's House Histories and we're going to be looking at another controversial topic. So we're going to be looking at the uh, the life, work and struggles of the British coal miners from 1919 to 1990. And I've called this War Heroes to Enemies of the State with a, a question mark before there are angry, angry emails. Now, I'd like to start with the, works, with the words of George Orwell in 1930. He said, Our civilization is founded on coal, more completely than one realises until one stops to think about it. The machines that keep us alive and the machines that make the machines are all directly or indirectly dependent upon coal. In the Western world, the coal miner is second in importance only to the man who ploughs the soil. Upon their shoulders, everything that is not growing is supported. Now, in 1900, coal was king, and men flocked from rural areas to pit villages for work, desperately grim though it was, deep as hell, and twice as hot. Now, above ground, housing was primitive and in short supply. We have here the words of the coal miner, Lewis Traharis. We had to bathe in the kitchen. There was no privacy. We had to dry our clothes there too. The fumes arising from the pit clothes were in the air and you could grind the dust that was coming from them. Now dust was the silent killer. When a miner was in his 40s and 50s causing men to wheeze what they called the come away with me wheeze. Diseases like silicosis, emphysema and bronchitis. It was also incredibly dangerous. From 1851 to 1920 there were 48 coal mining disasters in South Wales alone, killing 3,000 people. From in 1913, 439 men died at the Universal Colliery in a methane gas explosion. Now, the industry also saw bitter disputes between the Mining Federation of Britain, their union, and the coal, miners, the coal mine owners. Now, by 1908, the MFGB, the Mining Federation of Great Britain had 600,000 members. Pay was about £1.10 shillings a week, but unemployment, strikes and lockouts were common. And then came the First World War. Now coal miners flocked to join the army. The pay was approximately the same, but the work was regular. By February 1915, around a quarter of all of the nation's miners had joined the army. Coal production was slowing and coal famines were being reported to the government. Demand was soaring for war production and also the French and Belgian coal fields had been overrun by the Germans. As an aside, without the French and Belgian coal fields, the, the Germans couldn't have carried on the war for so long. They would, and France had previously been largely self-sufficient in coal, but France has now desperately needed British coal. And so just as demand soared for British coal, the supply had fallen. But the army had welcomed miners. The miners were strong, used to discipline and teamwork. Many of them joined the pioneer regiments, as the army needed their digging skills to improve the trench lines. However, many coal miners had proven to be too short. Most miners were around five foot tall, and to join the army you had to be five foot three inches. Hence the MP, Alfred Bigland, had created what they called the Bantam Regiments, or the Devil's Dwarves. Two whole divisions, the 35th and 40th, would eventually be created of men who were under regulation height. Also, in the 20th of December 1914, the Germans had blown ten small mines under a British Indian regiment. A first of all, mines where you dig underneath the trench lines, pack the, uh, pack the tunnel of explosives and blow the below the trench line up. It's not something you step on. The Germans had tunnelled underneath a British line and blown up a British Indian regiment. It was clear the British would have to respond in kind. Now, in February 1915, eight tunnelling companies were created. Within four days, civilians were drafted and sent to the front at Cavinci. Now, most of the first draft were sewer workers and tunnellers from the London Underground. But the army then turned to coal miners, who created the 171st Tunnelling Company. That month they blew up the first British mine under the German lines, under Hill 60 at Ypres. 
Eventually, the British Army would have 21 tunnelling companies, and they would fight a dirty, dangerous underground war, fighting in the dark with spades, picks and shovels. Around 1,500 to 2,000 died underground, but at Messine Ridge in 1917, these mines would kill around 10,000 German soldiers in a single day and allow the British to storm the heavily defended Messine Ridge. At home, the British government took control of the coal mines, improving safety standards and raising wages. In October 1916, the government introduced coal rationing based on the number of rooms in a house. But in 1917, there were 48 strikes involving some 200,000 coal workers calling for more pay. They were in a difficult situation. They knew that the country needed them, and so, logically, this is the right time to strike to get what you want. But it's unpatriotic to do so in wartime. But the government's not just going to give them the pay they deserve without asking for it. It's a real difficult situation, and strikes begin in 1917. But in 1918... With Russia out of the war, and when the Germans break through the British and French front line in the Ludendorff Offensive, which is covered in other, in other videos, the miners rallied round, and the, the number of strikes collapses and start to work extra shifts to try and dig more coal to help feed British industry to replace the losses in materiel in the battles on the Western Front. But as the war ends, the number of strikes increase as the men now fear for their future, now that their industry is considered less vital. By 1920, things had temporarily improved as the economy boomed, but by 1921, there was a new recession and increase in unemployment. This boom was caused by the fact that many men, of course, had saved a lot of money during the First World War, and they came home and they spent it, and they invested it, and the, the British invested the, the savings mostly in coal, steel, and textiles, that obviously, with hindsight, was a was a big mistake for the British economy. But it meant that in 1920 there was, there was a post-war boom. But it's being fuelled by the money saved by people during the First World War, which therefore is a finite resource. And 1921 there's a new recession and rising unemployment. Now, a new England was being built after the First World War. There were new industries and a new prosperity. But the miners, crucially, were left out of this. It was mostly in the South and in the Midlands. Between 1920 and 1935, the numbers employed in the British coal mines would fall by about a third, from 1.2 million to 0.8 million, while Britain's share of the world coal output fell from 59%, I mean, that's a, that's a shocking figure to come from one small island, 59% of world coal fell to 37%. Now, the MFGB was the country's largest Union at 900,000 members in 1921.